Well, I want to say welcome to all of our great people at our Coweta campus, our Sepulpa campus, those of you that are watching online, and welcome back to our series, Route 66, where we're teaching through the Bible, just a book at a time, going through the entire uh, collection of books in the Bible. If you've got a Bible or you've got a device that you can uh, get a hold of a Bible on, then I want you to turn to Galatians 5. That's the book that will be in, the letter that will be in in just a little bit. But before we get there, I want to ask you, in what situations do you reserve your strongest language for? In, in what situations do you get the most upset? What, what makes you angry? Uh, maybe it's when, I don't know, people are driving and they're not paying, paying attention. Uh, sign me up for that one right there. Or maybe my biggest deal is when people don't put things back where they got them to begin with. Maybe for you it's when people are dishonest. When they don't tell the truth, or maybe you get angry at some injustice. What do you suppose would uh, make an apostle of God the angriest? What, what would cause that kind of, of, of strong response? Or let's just say somebody that's a, a, a church leader, what, what would cause them to get angry? Maybe it's when there's sin in the congregation, sin in the ranks, or maybe it's when church attendance is down. Uh, maybe it's when the church is losing uh, its religious liberties, or maybe it's when people aren't paying attention to the sermon. We're going to look at Galatians today, and we're going to look at probably what what is the strongest language that we have recorded from the Apostle Paul? In fact, in just these short six chapters, I want you to get just a sampling of some of the phrases that he used. He says in Galatians 3.1, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Now, that's not a word we use very often. I didn't even know it was really a word. I thought it was a show that was on back about a witch when, when I was little back in the 60s. But, you know, obviously he's like, Who's, who, who are you letting trick you? Or Galatians 4.11, he says, I fear for you that somehow I've wasted my efforts on you. Hey, you're so bad, I, I, I just wasted my time. Or maybe the strongest, Galatians 5.12, as, as for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. If you're thinking he's saying what you think he's saying, then you are exactly right. In fact, it's probably worse than that. So as we'll see here in the context, uh, the, the term uh, circumcision is going to come up. And so uh, there are people that were demanding that that something take place in this, in this church as a part of their, uh, in these churches as a part of their, their practice of faith. And so basically what he's saying, those people, I wish they would, well, circumcision means to cut around and he's saying cut off. That's what he's saying right there. And so this is strong, strong language from the apostle Paul. The majority of the New Testament are letters like this. And the majority of them are written by the Apostle Paul. Most of the time, he would write to a specific city, to a specific church within a city. But in this occasion, he is not writing to just one church. He's writing to churches in, in an entire Roman province. It would be like the difference between uh, somebody writing a church to the, Sepul the church in Sepulpa or the church in Coweta or to the church here in Broken Arrow. That would be writing to a church. But what Paul is doing in Galatians is it would be like writing to the churches in northeastern Oklahoma. He's taking an entire region and he is writing to them. And what he is going to do is he's going to write to these people who, by the way, are mostly Gentiles. They are people that don't have the Jewish background there, but they had become Christians. And some of them had been believers uh, uh, for maybe a couple of years, a few years at the most. So we're talking about new believers here, and Paul has some difficulties that he needs to address. I want to remind you that when a church is on mission, things are always messy. And that's what Paul keeps addressing here. He's dealing with messy situations because these churches are new. They've been planted and stuff just gets messy. When it's not messy, that's when we probably ought to worry because it's easier to maintain a status quo. It's easier to keep things tidy and to keep things neat. In fact, often the criticism that, of churches that are 
on mission, churches that are reaching people, is that the people go to church, a lot of them new Christians, they don't look like Christians. They're not acting like Christians. They, they look like new Christians. They look like immature Christians. And sometimes those people can be swayed by powerful personalities. And sometimes they're sexually active outside of marriage. And sometimes they have questionable business practices. And sometimes they end up with broken families. And sometimes they can be too easily swayed by culture. And sometimes uh, they don't know how to conduct themselves in worship. And sometimes they even doubt core doctrines like, like the resurrection. In fact, every one of those I just listed are ones that Paul addressed with the church in Corinth, pulled right out of 1 Corinthians. The church in Corinth struggled with all of those problems that were listed. It was messy, and, and the church in Galatia, churches in Galatia struggled. Our church struggles. Growing churches, churches that are on mission, they struggle with things like that. And so we're going to see that in the Galatian churches. But they're struggling with something that's a little different. They're struggling because a group of false teachers had infiltrated the church. They had come in and they were teaching things that were against what the gospel really is. They were teaching things that were against what Paul had come and taught. And Paul calls them Judaizers, from the Jewish term there. But they were people that were coming and saying, yeah, you're saved by Jesus, but you still have to keep the law of Moses. You still have to keep the Old Testament law. And so we're going to read some terminology throughout uh, this book. And, and a lot of it is, is referring to the same thing. When it says the law, when it says Old Testament law, law of Moses, and even some of the references to circumcision, they all have to do with the same thing of people that were coming in and saying, you have to do whatever it is. You have to jump through these hoops to be right with God. In fact, we read in Acts chapter 15 when the church leaders address this very subject right here. So it's not contained just in, in, in the book of Galatians. It, it's talked about in other places, and it's the same thing, how the church is going to address people saying there is more to being saved than just accepting Jesus. You've got to jump through certain hoops. And so I want us to back up just a little bit before we get into the text, and let's talk about in the Old Testament how people had access to God, how people engaged God. Through that Old Testament system, there was the holy temple. That's where people engaged with God, and you obeyed the sacred law of Moses. That was how you engaged with God. You had a holy man or a priest that would atone for your sins and would help you do a sacrifice so that you could be right with God. That was how you got to God. But in the New Testament, Jesus came, and like we talked about last week from 2 Corinthians 5, Jesus reconciled us with God. There's no temple, there's, there's no law, there's no, uh, no priest. Jesus became our high priest, and we became a new creation. And so the hoops that people used to have to jump through to get to God, the things that people had to do to access God... Jesus died for those things along with our sin once and for all. In fact, Paul's going to address that in chapter 2. He's going to say a person's not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. That, that word justified right there, it means pronounced innocent before God. If you're justified, you are made innocent before God. And what Paul says is it's not by the things that we do. He says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, through the things that we do, then Christ died for nothing. If we're going to say, yeah, Jesus died, and we believe that, but there's just other things that you can do to access God, then if that's the case, Jesus, Jesus died for nothing. There, there was no reason for him to do that. And what these Judaizers were doing to the Christians that lived in Galatia, they were coming along and saying, Jesus isn't enough. There are other things that you have to do. You have to be circumcised if you're a male. And so what happens is Paul picks up his pen and with a little bit of an attitude, he writes this letter to the churches. I want to get to Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 and get right into the meat of it. He says, so Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. 
So again, the history here is that people were coming in and saying, no, 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 no. Now you, I know what Paul said, but this is what you've got to do. Now that you're saved, you've got to go by, go by following these rules, doing these things. And what Paul is saying is, no, don't get stuck again in trying to fulfill the law. You have been made free, not so you could be imprisoned again, but so you would be free. And that's what is going to concern Paul here greatly is this legalism that just is leaking all over the place. In fact, what I find terribly interesting is that when we were walking through the letters to the church in Corinth, Paul is going to spend five verses, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse, first five verses of it, addressing the sexual sin of a man and his stepmom. I mean, if, if we're honest, we're looking at that and that's, that's like really bad. That, that's a bad thing right there. Five verses that Paul is going to spend addressing that specific sexual immorality. But he's going to spend an entire book of six chapters dealing with and correcting these legalists. And so the question is, what, which one do you think Paul saw as the greatest threat? Which, which one do you think Paul sees as the greater danger? I mean, both of them are condemned. Both of them are destructive. But I think Paul would say to us, you know, listen, when you, when you, when you indulge in sin, there, there's a chance that you're going to come to your senses. But, but with this thing of, of legalism, it, it's, a, it's a much greater danger. And just like those Judaizers in the, day, in, in, in the Apostle Paul's day, what, what we often do is we, we resort to some kind of marker, something that we can reassure ourselves that we're in good standing with God. That's what's taking place right here. If you'll just get circumcised, then you're in good standing with God. In the era that I grew up with, if... You didn't drink, smoke, chew, or go out with girls that do, then you were in good standing with God. It was a marker that some people made and said, these are the things that, you know, qualify you as a follower of Jesus and show that you're a follower of Jesus. And what we've got to do is we've got to stand firm against those good for nothing markers, and we have got to put our total trust in Jesus for our salvation. Those things don't save us. They don't justify us. In fact, Paul's going to go on in the next chapter, chapter 6, and he's going to say the problem really comes down to when we take pride in ourselves and, and when, we, when we compare ourselves with other people. When we do those kinds of things, what it does then, he says, is it gives us dividing lines. It gives us things where we can compare ourselves. We're at least better than that person. Well, I, I may not have it all together, but I certainly don't do those things. I keep these rules and laws and my markers. I've got those nailed down. Look what he says in chapter 6, verse 12. Those are trying to force you to be circumcised. What's their motivation? They want to look good to others. They want to impress other people. They want to look good in the sight of other people. And so Paul says, quit putting your efforts into making a good impression. And he would say that to us. Your, your efforts are useless. Quit trying to make an impression with the Christians around you. It may make you feel better temporarily. You may puff up a little bit, may feel like you got your act together, but ultimately it's going to bring bondage. And so what ultimately Paul is saying right here is don't lose your freedom. You have been made free through Christ. Don't give it away to somebody. Don't lose it. Don't get stuck trying to follow some other kind of, of system of religion because it will only bring you bondage. So last Sunday night, I was speaking at this Tulsa Together event at the First Baptist Church, North Tulsa. And by the way, I just want to say thank you, Cedar Ridge people. You came and supported that. Our church was represented so well. Uh, I, I just was proud that we had so many people who were taking part. Uh, people were like, we don't, we don't know what to do, but we're at least going to come and be a part of something like that to show our unity 
as a community. And so we were there. We had a great time. It was a great service. And, and uh, well, it got to the end of the service, and we went to the fellowship hall. And Andrea and I and lots of you, we stayed around, and we drank uh, Kool-Aid and, and ate cookies and talked with people that we didn't know, met new people. And, and uh, people started to kind of filter out. And pretty soon, uh, it, Andrea and I and a couple other people, and so we head to the door, and we're going to leave. And I get to the front door of the church, and I'm thinking, I'm, that's a pretty good drive home. I probably better stop in the restroom. Well, the only restroom that I'd seen was back in the fellowship hall. So I said, wait for me here. I'm going to go back to the restroom. I went all the way back to the fellowship hall, walked in, and did what I needed to do. And I walked out, and all the lights were out. If that wasn't bad enough, I walked to where you went back into the main part of the church and one of those doors that pulls down had been not only shut, had been locked. It wasn't going to open. And I began to get a little nervous how I'm going to get out of here. I knew back in the fellowship hall there was no way to get out. And I turned look and there's two doors. And this door in this hallway goes out into a covered area that obviously I cannot exit from. This door over here, I sure enough can unlock, but I can't lock it back. And so I know if I walk out that door, uh, I'm going to have to find somebody that's going to come back and lock it again for me, but I have no other options. So I think finally I have gotten out of this church building in which I inadvertently got locked within and I walk out. I think I'm free and I realize that I'm in a area that has been fenced off. There's a six foot chain link fence around this. Fortunately, there's a gate, but I look and the gate is chained and padlocked. So I want you to imagine this. Your preacher last Sunday night is in North Tulsa. He is in a suit and he is scaling a six foot uh, galvanized fence so he can get out and go find his wife and get back in the car. And I made it without incident. And I did find a janitor to go back and lock the door for the record. But that's what happens when we ascribe to this. It is possible that you can get out of one bondage and find yourself right back into another. And that's what Paul's caution is. Don't give away your freedom. Don't lose your freedom. You have been set free by Christ. Don't, don't get back into bondage. Don't get back into bondage. Verse 13 of chapter 5. For you've been called to live in freedom. There's that word again. My brothers and sisters, but... Don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. You've been set free, but don't use your freedom to satisfy, to indulge your sinful nature. Just because you've been set free from your sin doesn't give us the right to continue to live in that sin. In fact, as we walk with Jesus, we distance ourselves from our past sinful nature. And so while Paul is careful to say to us, don't lose your freedom, in verse 13 he says, don't abuse your freedom. Don't use it as a license. Don't use it to indulge yourself in, in sin. With freedom comes responsibility. And what our culture says is, well, if I'm free, I can, I can do whatever I want. I have rights. I can do whatever I want to. But Paul reminds us that that view just leads to more bondage. Verse 14, he goes on and said, instead, instead of that, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, that's exactly right. When you sum up all of the Old Testament law, all the law of Moses, if people just would love people, that would pretty much cover everything. Love God and love people and that, that would nail it. You know, the clearest expression of God's love is Jesus. And Jesus demonstrated love best by the way that he managed the tension between grace and truth. I want you to think about Jesus defining love for us by the way that he managed grace and truth. John chapter 8, the story that John tells us is that a woman is brought to Jesus. We find out later that it's religious leaders who are trying to trick Jesus, trying to find some fault in his teaching. They bring this woman and say, she's committed adultery. What are you going to do to her? And they, they know they've got Jesus in a little bit of a spot there. No matter how he answers, it's not going to satisfy them. But he, he, he comes through on this and he fools them. And he tells them the one that's without sin, throw the first stone. And we're told that they eventually began just to trickle away. They, they had been had by Jesus. 
And he looks down at the woman and she says, You're, you, what are you going to do? And he goes, where, where are the people that, that, that were condemning you? And she said, they're gone. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. What we see this beautiful tension that Jesus masterfully uh, d- performs right here for us is that tension between the grace, I don't condemn you, and the truth of go and sin no more. It's a little bit like the tension of a rubber band. For this rubber band to have any purpose, for it to have any use, it has to have that, that tension. It has to have the tension. The tension of what we're saying is grace and truth. Because one without the other, well, it isn't love. You can't have love without both grace and truth. Without grace, love is ineffective. Without truth, love is worthless. And so we've got to figure out how we manage that uh, relationship between grace and truth. That's the greatest expression of love. In fact, there are parents who do this well with their children. They manage grace and truth. And they discipline and they make sure their children understand things that they need to, but there's also a time for them to be gracious as a parent. It may be our greatest challenges, challenge now as Christians in our culture is managing, telling our culture the truth, but doing it with grace, doing it in love. So what some people want to do is they want to push the truth part. They want to be all about the truth. In fact, you get to the end of chapter 5, about verse 19 and a couple of verses following, and we see this list of things, and it says something like, these are the acts of the sinful nature, and it carries off a, a list. By the way, I don't believe any of the lists that we find in the Bible are necessarily exhaustive lists. This is just some things that, uh, that uh, the Apostle Paul lists off for here and says, hey, sinful nature things, these are obvious. Things like sexual immorality and, and impurity. In fact, it's very similar to a list maybe you read through uh, last week when we were going through the books of First and Second Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 has a list. And what happens is we like to pick out certain sins within those lists and make that the really bad sin. That's the really evil one right now. And we use them as proof texts. In fact, I've had people come to me and say, look at 1 Corinthians 6. It says that homosexuality is wrong. It says it's wrong right there. And I'm, I'm, I can't disagree with that. It, it, it absolutely is wrong. But what happens is we want to point out are certain things. It's, it's, it's a sin. But look what 1 Corinthians chapter 9 says at the beginning of the list. It says, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Then it gives the list. And so what I need to ask you by show of hands at all of our campuses, how many of you have done wrong? So the truth of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9 is that we're all in the same boat. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. And what that does is it causes us to put down the magnifying glass that we look at with each other, and it causes us to look at our own sin, to, to look, at our, look at ourselves, to take a hard look at ourselves, because we see the truth from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. But look what Paul does when he balances that tension with grace just two verses later. Some of you were once like that. Like what? Well, that you did wrong. The, the uh, homosexuality, and then it includes liars and drunkards and gossips, all those you know, little sins. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Listen to that past tense kind of understanding right there, that terminology. That's what you were. And so what Jesus does here again is he both confronts my sin and he forgives my sin. In fact, that's why personally I approach subjects that are culturally or generationally, that's the really evil sin of our time. I approach them with a lot of humility because I know I need both Jesus to confront my sin and to forgive my sin. So what some people do is they want to push the truth part 
want to want to center around that. But what some other people do is they want to push the grace part. They don't want to think about the truth. They want to push grace. And again, it creates this imbalance that that doesn't work. That's not true love. It's not the kind of love that Jesus tells us about. There has to be that tension between both grace and truth. And so let's take marriage for example. Jesus in the Gospels affirms Genesis chapter two and says a man and woman were meant for marriage. They're to leave their parents and they become one flesh. That's sexual terminology right there. And so we see God's definition of marriage and sex. Bible's very clear on this. There's really no confusion. Polygamy, pornography, college students sleeping around, teenagers sending naked pictures of themselves to each other, adultery, homosexual relationships, lust, all of it. It's, it's, it's all sexual sin. And it's not good for you as an individual, and it's not good for us as a society, because the one who created it all says, it's, it's not what, the way I created it. It's, it's not best. So God's, God says, sex is my gift to a man and woman in marriage. And in fact, research validates for us that those in monogamous married relationships are having the best sex, the most frequent sex, because it's true freedom. But our culture has a different message. Our culture gives a different message to all of us, and that message is that Anyone that's doing all the other stuff that's outside of the way God defines it and prescribes it, well, they're the liberated ones. They're the ones that are that are that are free. They're the ones that are having fun. And those that are following the Bible, well, they're oppressed and they're miserable and they're missing out. And so what Paul does at the end of chapter five is say, you have to determine what voice you're going to listen to. Chapter 5, verse 16, I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. And the question for those of us that are followers of Jesus is, who are you listening to? Who are you listening to? You can feed your sinful nature and that thinking and those behavior patterns, but the Bible's clear. It leads to bondage and captivity, or you can let the Holy Spirit fill you up. You can let the Holy Spirit guide you, and it's going to take you in an opposite direction. In fact, just a few verses later, Galatians 5.22 But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in your life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. In other words, the Holy Spirit wants to fill you with the character and the nature of the God who made you. And as the Holy Spirit redirects your holiness and your righteousness, you lose your appetite for sin. It guides you in a different way. In fact, we probably need to take note that word that says the fruit in our lives. This is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Notice that it's singular. This is not fruits of the Holy Spirit. This is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. This is not a pick and choose thing. This is what the Holy Spirit does, and it comes as one package. And this is not stuff that you do. This is not hoops that you jump through. These are not additional things that you add to your list of, I've got to accomplish them for God. Because the truth is, you cannot make fruit grow. You can't do it. You can plant, you can protect, you can water and you care for it. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit, it's a Holy Spirit thing. So what is this Holy Spirit empowered grace and truth thing look like? Well, it looks like a church that we read about just a little over a year ago, our brothers and sisters at the Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. They gave us a little glimpse of it. June 17th last year, a young man named Dylan Roof walked into a Bible study. He was filled with sin, with racism, with evil. He sat among these innocent people, among them for an hour, listened to them worship, watched them pray, and then he shot and killed nine of them in cold blood. 
And how did they respond? Like Jesus. Like Jesus would, with love, with grace, and with truth. Myra Thompson was one of the people that were killed. Her husband, Anthony, was sitting in the courtroom in front of a judge. And we would have all understood if he would have gotten up and if he would have walked across and if he would have cussed uh, Dylan Roof out or if he would have cold cocked him, we would have all been sympathetic to that. But he didn't. Instead, he looked at that young man and he said, I forgive you and my family forgives you. But we would like you to take this opportunity to repent. Repent, confess, give your life to the one who matters most, Jesus, so he can change you. He can change your ways no matter what happens to you, and you'll be okay. Those are the words of somebody not demanding that their rights be observed and taken care of. That's somebody who is not just losing their freedom or abusing their freedom. That's someone who has ascribed to a higher law of love. And what it did is it gave the world a glimpse of what Christians stand for and what they live for in our world. What it does for us, it allows us to show every day that tension between grace and truth and to show people what real love is. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for teaching us through your word and through your messenger, the Apostle Paul. And Father, we're praying that you protect churches from The thing that just continues to come back and dog them since the first century, people saying there's more to to it than Jesus. And Father, forgive us when we've we've made it more difficult than it is, when we've created things more than just a simple faith in Jesus Christ. And God, I'm praying that that you would help us. Help us not, not to abuse our faith. Father, help our faith to be one that's expressed in works, that's active faith. But God, help us to trust you more than anything else. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.